So my computer clock has just ticked over to the seven o'clock in the morning. So uh, I technically, well not technically, physically was born in England, but did a little bit of elementary school in Chicago and then moved to Australia. So I have a little bit of a, a mixed accent. Somewhere along the way, I worked out of Oracle Silicon Valley headquarters for nearly 10 years. So I, my old joke about having the American accent because I watch too much TV doesn't really hold anymore because I had 10 years to, to, to get the real American accent. Let's make a start. So you will have seen the safe harbor statement, particularly with open source software, there's sort of no guarantees. Scheduling is very much subject to change as, as user demand comes in or some interesting problem comes up and we spend a lot of time on that. Don't buy anything based on anything that I say. So I am a product manager. I have a development background. I worked on PHP drivers for some years out of our Oracle Linux group, the same Linux group which I think today just released Dtrace as open source on GitHub. Dtrace being a great dynamic tracing tool. Um, I now am working in the Oracle database group and I have a sort of broader portfolio looking after a whole bunch of scripting language driver APIs, the access programming interfaces or drivers we call them, interfaces. What's the current terminology that you're familiar with? Is it drivers? Do you like drivers or APIs or, you know, everybody I think knows them as different things. But anyway, you know, all the scripting languages like Python, PHP, basically all of the C, C based languages. And in fact, this is what the, the wider group looks after. You can see in the red and the blue that there's a, a number of very key technologies there, obviously Java and .NET. I tend to focus on the C-based things and the open source particularly, which are the, the uh, blue, blue languages and blue drivers there. Um, I also liaise with the open source maintainers, third-party maintainers who look after other interesting languages. Uh, Ruby, Ruby OCI 8, um, the Rails maintainer and the Ruby maintainer recently got granted uh, Oracle ACE status, which is really pleasing because they put so much effort into, those, uh, into that ecosystem. And then we have a whole bunch of other languages there. Go is upcoming. Who's using Go? Anybody using Go? Heard of Go? Rust? Node? Okay. Anyway, so basically we do a lot of stuff, but if you have questions on any of this, come and ask me and I can kind of hook you up with what's going on. So who's using Node.js? Who's actually using it now? Who wants to use it? And who's trying to avoid using it and just wants to know the arguments so they can <laughs> de de defeat it with? Okay, that's cool. And is anybody actually using it with Oracle Database? Currently using it? Fantastic, you don't work for Oracle, right? You're not, no, okay, fantastic. It's always nice to see users out there. Um, so I, I do have a few intro slides, obviously the few people need to perhaps be brought up to speed. Um, it is a very efficient JavaScript based, um, I guess we would call it a mid-tier system, a, a, a server, server gets overused, you mean database server, application server, whatever, so I tend to call it the, the mid-tier. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you don't really need a web listener. It just listens to network events and things like that. It kind of runs on this threaded model, event loop model. So it has a queue callback, as you can see down at the bottom. It's going to be putting work into that queue. MedThread's going to pick up that next unit of work and schedule it on one of those worker threads there in that bottom or middle, uh, middle block. And that worker thread's going to do the work, put the results back into the queue, and something else is going to pick it up. So it's kind of really trying to be fast and, and threaded and, and uh, get work done pretty efficiently. It's got a kind of callback model, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit later. Um, has pros and cons, but there are, there are ways around it if you don't like the cons. So Node Oracle DB is a database, what did we decide, driver, API? Driver, driver, okay, database driver. Um, it sits on top of the Oracle client stack, and that has pros and cons. The pros being that that has a lot of highly advanced, efficient, supported technology, including things such as network encryption. Um, so there's no sort of command in Node Oracle DB to, in, to turn on encryption. That's turned on at a lower level with a configuration file. So it can support that. It does high availability event management, um, buffering, all sorts of caching and things like that. Yes, you have to install it separately, but then you get all of that functionality for free and we can go and do some work and add value on top of that. Um, Node.js, obviously, you start with, there's a package install command to install the Node Oracle DB package. There are binaries available. And I don't have users on that slide, but there are users sitting off on the side somewhere and your scripts are being read. And obligatory, who was in the Python talk earlier? Um, okay, so you would have seen some of these jokes before, but the obligatory um, 
cloud slide there, you can connect to any database whether it's in the cloud or not. But uh, you can also run Node in the cloud if you want to as well. So quick overview. First release to GitHub. It seems just like yesterday. I guess it was a little bit longer. Um, open source, we maintain it. So open source has pros and cons. It means you're accessing the developers directly. If you have issues, you stick those on GitHub with an issues. You open, they call it an issue. Um, questions, whatever, developers are looking at it. You don't have to go, th go through the support channel, log tickets and things like that. The cons, obviously, um, you know, no guaranteed response times and things like that. But in general, I think you'll find it's probably better or as good as, as the other way. Um, and we do appreciate all the contributions that have been made into the driver. You can contribute if you like. The C level, there's also a JavaScript level on top, which I, I haven't really talked about, but if you want to extend the JavaScript level, some functionality there, you can contribute back into the community. And obviously then we would take over maintenance and you wouldn't have to worry about that. I don't want to read through this whole slide. Um, it's the kind of high level overview that we try to keep the, the class structure relatively simple. In fact, at the very bottom one, lobs, we don't even really use much anymore unless you're doing streaming for media or something like that. Uh, effectively, you have a connection and you can either have a standard connection or a pooled connection. And then you can either have results or if you want a uh, bigger result set, you know, hundreds of rows, thousands of rows, whatever, you can fetch those in, in batches using this result set methodology. Uh, the streaming is also available. Um, we have pre-built binary, so people who worked in the V1 days, Node Oracle DB V1, had to compile it themselves. We now have binaries for that available. So NPM install really just works for pretty much everybody, Linux 64-bit, Windows 64-bit, and Mac OS. Everything you install, no matter what language, you know, everybody talks about open source product X being really easy to install. Everything has like four or five tricks you have to know. Do you have to open a port here? Do you have to change a configuration file there? Yeah, we have one or two quirks about you know, setting the environment load, uh, you know, path or LD library path to, to make things run. That's our quirk. You know, get over with it. Works. Not going to read that. Uh, we don't have time to talk about all of these features, but you can see that it has quite a, an array of features. Um, so what are some things there I might not get down to? Um, end-to-end oh, -end tracing, perhaps, today I'm going to pick on. End-to-end um, -end tracing is a way that you can set an attribute. There's just an attribute flag in, in the code. In fact, there are various because there are three or four different kinds of attributes, the kind of hierarchy of attributes you can set. Um, very useful to set in the code. It's arbitrary string. You just set a string saying that this is my module for getting the sales data. So you just would, might put the word sales data in that attribute. That attribute's text would be sent across to the database and it would appear then in trace files, log files, you can query it. So you can correlate a query or administrators can go into Enterprise Manager and say, oh, sales data was taking this much percent of time because they can you know, group by that particular attribute. So yeah, use some of those features, high-end features. Okay, so what do we have? People who haven't seen it before, sample query. Um, some of you haven't used Node. You need to require this module standard every pretty much all of the languages you tend to have to, to load modules in at some stage or other. Um, oh look, my, you've got the results there already. My animation hasn't quite worked. Um, you get a connection. You have to connect to the database somehow. So this is a, the non-pooled connection. Username, password, there is the capability for external authentication. So you don't have to have passwords hard-coded or passed in via environment variable. So you can use Oracle's external authentication, LDAP servers and things like that. Um, here are the connect string. I'm just saying this is this is the modern Oracle connection string. I'm just saying the this computer name where the database is running and the service name that that database is configured to, to listen on. Um, you can use TNS connect strings. You can use TNS connection files if you want to. Um, this is obviously going to be easier. Uh, then you do execute. So you can kind of see people haven't seen it. This kind of gets confusing, so focus just on the red. You get a kind of callback. And so that when that connection is, has worked, then you get a callback with that connection object there on line five, and then you can use that connection, and we do the execute there on line seven. Doing a select, the multi-line back ticks, multi-line strings with back ticks. Um, otherwise, you have to do single strings, and string concatenation gets a little ugly. And bind variables, I'll talk a little bit about bind variables. A couple of output formats. It's very fast to construct an array of output, as you can see there on the right. Um, you know, it's standard Oracle isms, but you can also say I want an object if you want a JSON object back, JavaScript object back, and 
you know, we don't do that by default because you have to construct that object, you have to set the attribute names and things like that. Uh, but it's obviously there if you, if you want to use it. Anyway, so that's basic behavior. Oh, and then there's the callback from the execute itself, and the callback actually just dumps all of the rows out, as you've been seeing ever since the start. The default number of rows fetched is unlimited. V1, we did have a limit, which was a little bit of painful, but in version two, which has been out for a while, um, number of rows comes back as unlimited, and there's some tuning parameters for that. And then, obviously, error messages at the end. Um, yada, yada, yada. Done. Any questions? And I put this in. Uh, we also have promise support for people using promise support. And this is a newer async await, which came out with node 7.6. So technically, we, we sort of say 8, which is the first sort of stable release, long-term release of, of that stream. And so this has, as you can see, kind of a wait interface down there at level uh, line five. You just basically wait for the connection before you continue. So there's no kind of callback. You don't get this nested hierarchy. You just say, wait for that connection and, and don't do anything until that's completed. Um, resolve is, is where you do get the re results back there on, on line 11. No surprises for people who've using this. Are you using async await? Are you, what versions of Node are you using? Node 8? Yeah, this, this stuff's starting to look good. You should probably consider using this. OK. So this is really the agenda for today. That was the introduction, all of a 12-minute introduction. Sorry about that. Um, starts and ends with the connections. I'm going to speak about, obviously, data out, data in. That was the topic. And sorry, did I just go to? No, that's fine. Um, connection we talked about. The kind of key thing there is a the little picture on the bottom right. So when you create this connection, you are establishing the pipe across to the database, and you're starting a process on the database, which is that blue dot there on the database side. And that process takes some time to start up. It's got to have memory allocated, et cetera, et cetera. That's OK if you, that's what you want. But then it does take time if you're going to be doing it a number of times. So we do recommend using a pool in most cases. So you create a pool. And then from the pool, you can get a connection. And you can, uh, you know, a bunch of parameters you can see there on the screen about sizing and, and what have you, timeouts when pool is idle so that the pool can shrink back down. You're not using resources. And you're holding those connections open all, all the time that the, uh, the pool, if, if the pool's um, was at size two, minimum size two, you would always just see those two server processes in blue on the right-hand side. So one other thing I didn't mention here, of course, is you want to release those connections. Because if you don't release them using a, a, the release that I think I showed on the previous slide, no, I didn't show. Um, if you don't release it, then nobody else can pull it out of the pool again. So make sure you are releasing connections. Da -da. You can also have something called database resident connection pooling. I don't talk about that in this talk, no time. So you can have a pool on the database side, which is great, because if you have multiple node processes, each of those, as you might see in this particular example, would have you know, two processes to the database, and that would be two by n. So there'd have to be multiple processes on the database side. DRCP lets you even pool on the database side so you can share processes that side. So just technology you can use if you're running into constraints in terms of memory on the database side. So what's the scenario? And this is, by the way, true of standalone connections. You want to allow 10 concurrent users. Um, you've got pool max 10. What's going to happen? So you've got four worker threads. That's the default in, in Node. Um, you can configure it, upper limit's 128. So in-use connections are going to wait for database responses. It's just the way it is. If you started a you know, SQL statement across the database, it's going to have to wait for a response to come back. You know, obviously, select's going to wait. But even an insert's going to have to wait for a response to come back from the database. So that worker thread's going to be held, not able to be used by anybody else. And you've only got four of those. So you're going to run into a kind of limit there. So slower response than you kind of expect. You know, things are kind of working. But you could get deadlocks if one of those threads is trying to you know, update something which something else is already locked. So solution, just increase that thread pool size. You need to do this before Node starts the thread pool. So you can, you can increase it in Node.js application code. But if you don't s increase it before the thread pool is even initialized, you will still only get four threads. So you think you've set it to 10. But actually, it says you, know, you set it too late, and it's only got four. And there's actually no easy way to find out what it's set, been set to. So here I'm using you know, Unix, Linux command export. You can set it. 
or you can actually run a, a ENV and, and set it at the environment level inside Node, but just be careful you do it like really at the start. You may want more threads than you actually do, than you have connections, because you may be doing non-database work. So you may want to even increase that thread pool a little bit bigger. And remember, you can only go up to 128. So scenario two, so you've got four threads, you know, it doesn't really matter, but that's the scenario here. You open one connection, so this is not, not pooled. I'm just trying to show you know, another kind of thing you should be aware of. You open just one connection, and you try and do this promise.all. What does promise.all do? It tries to just fire everything. One select, three inserts, but you've only got one connection. So the select is going to get a thread from the worker pool. Query's going to block all those inserts. You're going to get, a th you're going to get threads. You're going to get all four threads, but only one of them can actually do anything because you've only got one connection. So connections can only do one thing at a time. So the kind of moral of the story is keep control in the JavaScript layer. Watch out for things like promise all, you know, use async series if you're using uh, async each series or async series instead of async parallel if you're using the async library. Sorry, that's the old school async, not the, not the async await programming style, but the async NPM package. Um, so, you know, try and keep control and make sure you're not starving yourself with threads and or connections. Scenario three, this kind of came up. Um, and we've actually got better solutions for this now, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, somebody was trying to load a lot of data into the database, so they wanted to open a lot of connections and just fire off a lot of stuff all at once. So it kind of did promise all and got a lot of connections and then tries to insert a lot of data. Um, can your database even handle all those connections open? And if you've got multiple users trying to do the same thing on different node tiers or whatever, can, can you know, that multiplies the, the load. Um, you've got multiple connections, so you can't really do transactional consistency. So you kind of got this, you know, problem as it were. And we've got the solution now, um, which I will go into a lot of detail later. Later slides. Okay. So here's a pro tip. So I've got some pro tips in here. Yes. So this comes from our real world performance tuning team. So these are the people who really know what's going on. They say don't have dynamic pool sizes. And there's a whole lot of reasons. Um, if you look in the Node Oracle DB documentation, there's a link to, to their documentation, to the RWP doc. You can read all about it there. The real thing is, of course, when you suddenly need all these connections, as people log in, is when the database is pretty much under most load and you start getting things really unstable. You really want to size your systems for the maximum load that they have. These are tools you can use them. Don't have to use it, but this is their tip. To keep most stable systems, Make sure your pool sizes are fixed. No minimum, no maximum. Um, and they also have some recommendations about how, how big these pools can be depending on the, the server side load. On the database side, they've got some calculations which may or may not be accurate. Um, they you know, were as of when that doc was published a year or so ago uh, about numbers of CPUs and sockets and things like that and, and load that the database side can actually handle. So that's their, their big pro tip. Um, we've also got a lot of settings, Oracle Net, the SQL Net layer, as people know, it used to be called SQL Net. A um, whole bunch of parameters. I've got one or two mentioned later, but you know, there are a couple of other things there that you could actually add as well to stop the load slamming the database at a particular time if you've got a lot of people trying to log into the database. Okay, ending connections, when I, I didn't have that before. So definitely required for pooled connections. You've got to release it back to the pool so somebody else can pull it out. Um, and it's also best practice for standalone. You'll just want to release resources as early as possible um, so that somebody else can use those resources. Um, anybody used version 2.0 and 2.1 of Node Oracle DB? Have you used 2.0? Okay, we had, we were trying to, we've been working our way towards managing this stuff a lot better. So in 2.2, um, we let you kind of release things when you want, even if they're still in use behind the scenes for whatever operations, you know, how, no tends to do things when you're least expecting it. But if you're trying to stream from a lob, for example, you're still going to need that pipe across to the database. But you can physically now actually, in your code, close the connection. You'll think it's closed. But Node's actually using it. And at an appropriate point, it will close it off behind the scenes for you. So we've, we've done a lot of work there in the, the current 2.2 release. Um, and obviously, try not to release them too early in some cases. You might see some, some kinds of errors. Um, you know. It's, it's a little bit variable, so just watch yourself. Uh, oh, I, I don't mention streaming from lob instance. 
Oh yeah, I think we've just fixed that recently, okay. Um, another pro tip, basic high availability. So everybody wants free high availability. You know, Oracle has rack and it has all these great high-end solutions which you know, really have very beneficial practical applications. But everybody wants to kind of do it in the code. You're all developers, DevOps, you want to do it all yourself. So we do have some of that available to you. Um, and hopefully we'll expose more of this through the actual node API with node attributes and things like that. But for the moment, you can look at things like the SQL net parameter configuration file. And there's, there's steps on how to set this up in the Oracle, node Oracle DB documentation. Um, things like these connect timeouts and the receive timeouts. You know, if I'm waiting for some response from the database, how long can I wait before I'm going to say, give up, return an error to a user, or retry on a different connection, different connection to a different um, database instance, you know, with rack and things like that. Um, firewalls, we know this is a problem sometimes with, with what we call out of band breaks. Um, people trying to send signals and things across firewalls. Oracle, by default, in the current versions, has this thing called out of band breaks on. Sometimes firewalls block that, so you might need to turn that off if you want to make sure that your connection.break works. I also recommend updating to the 12.2 client library. So Oracle has client server cross version interoperability. So you can have 11.2 client libraries, and they can be talking to you know 9.2 database, 12.2 database, 18.0 database, I think. There's a, there's a supported matrix and there's a it works matrix, which has a, a wider range. Um, so certainly, if you're using you know, even 11.2 database, there's no reason why you can't upgrade your client libraries to 12.2. And you get some better features there in terms of um, the session pool, the, the connection pool that I spoke about earlier, um, whether we detect whether the network has dropped out, um, if that session's been just sitting there idle. So trust me, use it. OK, getting data out of the database. Duh, duh, duh. Where are we going? Whoops, did I go back? It's little tiny keys. OK, so we know direct fetches. A few methods. I've got, I think, four points or something like that. Um, you basically get all those rows returned, as I mentioned. You can get the result sets. I spoke about that re result set object in the class diagram. You just set the result set attribute true, and then you get a callback object, a result set object, and then you can call methods on that get row or get rows if you want to get more than one row at a time. Streaming. Anybody using streaming? Streaming is kind of kind of useful. Um, you know, the advantages of things like get row and, and the query stream is you get sort of one data row per well event in case of, of query stream. You get a data event, so you just get one one record back. So you can be listening it for any listening listening it listening for it anywhere in your code without having to really worry about the tight coupling between uh, methods in your code. Get row is similar. You just call get row when you want. We do a lot of buffering internally, um, and I'll cover some of that a little bit later. So, th sorry, did you want me to go back for your photograph? Okay. <laughs> I have a blog post on this up, by the way, as well. Okay, direct fetch is easy to use. We've got this fetch array size parameter, so I spoke about that a little bit. That's an internal parameter. doesn't affect what you see in the application at all. It's just a, a buffering size internally. Um, I. I know that, um, well, this has various names in various places. Some people call it like prefetching, some people call it array fetching. How it's implemented, you don't need to know about. We're trying to cover and hide all of that stuff from you. It's just a tuning thing. But you do need to go and tune it for your system and your queries. We, you know, we can't really tell you what's best for your row width and number of rows you want to return, uh, and also um, network distances and things like that. It has one drawback. You need one big array to hold all your results, and you may not know how big that array is up front. Um, and you've got to do this concatenation of batches of records. It, so internally, it, it, it happens. So we do that for you, but we've got to allocate memory. We've got to re-move things around, relocate things. Um, can get a little bit of fragmentation. Um, you know, it, it's certainly something which I would recommend using, but using it with a provisor that you know how many rows you're going to get back, and don't be caught out by these outlier cases. Uh, result set fetches. I showed you the direct fetches way, way back. So this is a result set. Um, fetch array size true. And that's, again, this buffering for the get row, because get row is only going to return run one row at a time to the application. But internally, I need to do some kind of buffering. So we let you do that. Um, for the plural get rows, you pass in the argument of how many rows you want. And that's the, that's the tuning parameter. You don't, you don't need the fetch array size there. 
one little thing here is, is always close the result set. You know, we need to know when you're finished with it, when to free up resources and things like that. And if you want to look at the final code, you obviously have to call back into that nested routine. It does look a little messy, but the key thing is to look at the red text, and it'll all make sense. Fetching lobs. So Oracle likes to stream lobs. I guess it was kind of designed in the multimedia days, and everybody thought everybody was going to be serving video and things like that. Turns out, of course, nowadays people's text has kind of grown towards the lob space. You know, people want megabyte of text, three megabytes of text, something like that. Not quite long lobs, but you know, more than the, the 32K that Oracle holds in its varchar two columns nowadays. And some of you may be using you know, 11.2 database, which can only hold 4K. So, so you end up using lobs a lot. So you can do that streaming, but it's going to cause what we call round trip to the database. You've got to get the locator for that, the pointer to the data, and then you've got to go and get the data, and that's a bit slow. So by fetching and binding as strings or, or buffers, you can avoid that second round trip to the database. And here we've got this fetch info. There's also a, a top-level attribute you can set called fetch a string, and you can fetch a fetch a string and fetch as buffer. You can just say, hey, for this particular column, which I've here called my col, just return it to me directly. I don't want to mess around with locators. I don't want to mess around with callbacks and things like that. Just give me the data. Give it to me now. Uh, for inserting, you can also do sim something similar. Just pass in the string or the buffer buffer for, for blobs. Don't need to mess around with locators. So do definitely recommend that. That's a lot faster than, than trying to do streaming if you, if you don't need to do streaming size data fetches. Some more pro tips. Anybody use the offset next fetch stuff? And my SQL would, be, would have been called limit. I guess we somehow ended up with the ANSI syntax. I don't know why that is. Um, so instead of having to do the nested query syntax, which you used to have to do with row counts and things like that, um, you know, version 12 of the database, you get this, this feature. Obviously, use that, because you don't want to send more data back from the database to node, then you're going to process. I mean, it's just a waste of resources to even sort it out on disk to do the order buys, to block reads, and things like that. Don't need to do that. Don't need to do the transfer across to node of unnecessary data. So limited in the database side. Um, if you're using direct fetches and you know you're only going to get one row, and people tell me, and I don't know whether this is true of node users, but people tell me that a lot of queries against the database just return one row because they're doing you know, frameworks which just expect one row, one object, something like that. So if you know you're only going to get one row back, and obviously you know, if you know you're going to get two, then do two. But if you're just going to get one row back, then set the fetch array size to one. Then you don't have to allocate memory in node or in the network or on the database side. Da, da, da. Obviously, as I mentioned before, if you don't know how much data you're going to get back, fetch using a result set. And this is another little trick. In fact, I have a vague feeling, am I allowed to mention the word bug in this, this territory? I have a vague feeling that this is an optimizer, Oracle SQL optimizer feature, quote unquote. Um, and I know they're doing some work there, and I know that because I was in the elevator with somebody and I was asking him, and he said yes, and then I had to fly out to Boston, so that was the end of the conversation. But um, the optimizer, when you're kind of casting a fixed value, here I'm binding, you know, bind variables, TS, so whatever that is in my node is going to be a, a fixed value to a timestamp column. For some reason, the optimizer doesn't handle that very well in some cases, and you end up with full table scans instead of indexes being used. So until you get the sort of patch versions of Oracle Database, if they ever come out with patches and whatever they decide, remember the, the disclaimer earlier, um, you might find that you're going to get better wear performance if you query performance if you do this cast. OK, so you're learning a lot of pro tips. I hope this has been valuable you know, so far. Um, but the big pro tip, obviously, is this round trip thing. This round trip between the database it's from the server, client to the server, and back to the client again. And that's it. You know, in summary, you know, I've mentioned it before. Don't fetch data you don't need to use. Don't overcommit or roll back, because that may cause a round trip. And that may also actually cause extra database load, but that's, that's not a, a round trip issue. Um, we have a feature which I don't go into in this presentation called client result caching. So if you're doing queries from you know, zip code tables, things like that, those results can be stored by Oracle. You don't need to know anything about it 
in the node process space and we don't need to go back to the database to fetch it again if, you, if there's another query executed with the same, uh, you know, same signature. Oracle handles, cache and validation, all that sort of stuff for you. So that's kind of pretty neat. So we've got, got a whole bunch of things there. Have a look at uh, some of these things in the manual. Um, ping, we've got a connection ping functionality, so you can ping across to the database to check whether the connection is live, so you don't have to do a select one from Joule. This is a new feature which came out at the start of the month, connection.ping. Yeah, but that's a round trip. So any of those round trips, whether it's not whether or not it's your own select one from Joule or, or a ping, you know, don't do it unless you really need to know what's happening. It's better to try a statement, try a connect, see whether it fails, try and execute, see whether it fails, and you know, do the processing and the error handling rather than say, oh, is it going to work when I do it? Oh, let me do it. You know, that's double the amount of work. And you still have to do error handling. So don't, don't overdo round trips. So putting data into the database. So single row DML, you know, DML, you know, insert, update, delete, merge. Anybody use merge? Fantastic. Okay, merge commands DML. Um, single row is pretty easy. You know, we've seen connection execute. Auto commit. I just spoke about round trips. So this, this auto commit can save you a round trip. If I have to do connection commit later, that's an explicit round trip. Auto commit is piggybacked onto the execute across the database. So it saves that round trip, improves scalability, well, performance, and then ultimately scalability. Obviously, don't over commit. You know, don't auto commit every single row. You're going to lose transactional consistency. Um, but it's a, a tool there which is really useful. Uh, da -da -da. Oh, DDL, oh, yeah, don't commit unnecessarily. DDL, of course, in Oracle land, you know, a create table or something is going to do a commit whether you like it or not. Long history. Okay, so that was kind of okay, a little slow if you're trying to do lots of data inserts because you had to call, execute a few times, round trips. We then introduced a third party contribution. Uh, binding for index by binary integer tables. So you can, in PL SQL, I'll kind of get to the, the no code later, you can, for example, have a procedure which, using the bulk insert, the for all command at PL SQL, um, just inserts all of the, the array passed into it in one statement effectively. So the, the node code below the line there, sorry, it's low. Um, we would then pass in an array of values right on the bottom line there, val. So we call my in proc colon val bv as the bind variable placeholder. And then below that is the bind variable block we're passing from node with the actual data values we're trying to pass in, the ID, one, two, three, four. And then we're saying, hey, we're passing in an array of numbers. The direction is bind in, and here are the numbers. So we had that, that's good. It works in a number of places. Thank you very much, Dieter, who contributed that just on a year ago. So new in 2.2, so 2.2 came out on what, 3rd of April, something like that? Execute many. So it's, we debated about the name, should we follow the Python's name or the JDBC name? We chose the Python name because that's our group. So it's not executing multiple statements, it's executing one statement with many data values. So here's the, uh, the example. So I've got two data values that I want to, you know, two sets of data I want to insert. I want to insert an apple and I want to insert a banana. And I've got my statement at the top. So you can see I have you know, a, key and a key and a fruit for, for each uh, data value, but just one statement. We have some new syntax, so we have an options parameter Auto commit you've seen before, so that kind of behaves the way you saw it before. We have this bind defs, which is like technically um, not needed for if you're doing in binds, because we can kind of look at the data. But because the way it works, we need to know maximum sizes. So you, you know, we keep having to look at data and reallocate buffers if we don't know what it is beforehand. So I recommend you use this bind defs, certainly for input data. And you definitely need it for output data where we don't have anything to, to tell us what to allocate, how much memory to allocate. And then we do this new execute many call with those uh, SQL, the data, and the options parameters. And we get a result back, which just says how many rows do I get inserted? Two rows. So I get a rows affected value. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's not kind of exciting, but not that exciting. So what about noisy data? So 
we would have seen this in the Python talk earlier. What happens, you know, the key is supposed to be um, non-null, but here I've got some null values for the key. Uh, that's not going to be so good. Um, you know, all sorts of other things could, could happen there. So we've got this new extra, well, we've got, it's all new. We've got an op additional flag batch errors. So if I set that as true, line defs we saw before, execute many we saw before. So the only real difference is you have some fake invalid data and this batch errors value. We get back in the results, callback, we get the rows affected. So we actually had two rows inserted. I can flip back to show you the data if you want. And we had some rows which couldn't be inserted. And the offset is the array position of the noisy data with a zero-based offset. So this didn't trigger an error. This is not the error callback. There's no error at this stage. It's a result callback. What happened is that you get um, uh, some of the rows inserted, and so a transaction is started in the database. And you can choose to commit or roll back if you want, or fix up this bad data, insert that, and can, you know, then commit the transaction. So we're giving you that choice. So there's no sort of error in this case. It's all coming back through the result callback. Um, and yep, we get the array of errors, one for each pro problematic record, zero based as I mentioned. Too many animations. I was having fun on the, uh, the flight here. So the interesting thing about auto commit in this case is that it's going to be ignored if there are DML errors. It'll be respected if there are no errors, but if there are those DML errors that like we saw here, um, the commit's not going to happen, even though you said I want to commit. So you have to explicitly commit. Again, you know, we don't want to, as Oracle, just arbitrarily assume that your data was okay and you're fine with invalid data being inserted or partial data being inserted. So we leave that up to you. Okay. So DML row count, it's a little easier to see with a delete. But sometimes you want to um, work out how many rows are affected. So yeah, how, many, how many apples were deleted? How many bananas were deleted? We can do that. So we've got yet another attribute, DML row counts. Line defs we saw before. This time we have a bad slide because that's not a number. But anyway, sorry about that. Um, I think you understand it's supposed to be a string there, the size. Um, and uh, there's a problem with these slides. You know, trying to f simplify it so you can understand what's going on and make the fonts big enough so you can see everything as this, this balancing art. So I had to take out some things later. Um, but at the bottom, if you can see in red, so on the right, it's a DML row count. So we still see two rows were affected, um, but we now get the row counts. There were five values with, um, five rows with apples were deleted and two rows with bananas were deleted. Do, do, do. This is the first time I'm giving this talk, by the way, so let me know how it goes at the end. DML returning. So DML returning is kind of useful, particularly if you want things like the row ID, as I show here. You want to know what the row IDs of those keys, those, the new data values were, so I then can go and do some updates or something else on them. Um, pass in some values. Notice there's an array of arrays. And result outbinds is an array of an array of arrays just the way it is, because you can actually have multiple values, particularly if you go back to those delete examples, you can have multiple values come back. It's kind of easier seen in practice than, than described. Um, I'm not sure, do I have a, another example? Yeah, I don't, I don't have an example, but um, I, I may have mentioned, and I think it's worth reinforcing, you can call PL SQL with execute many as well. So it's equivalent to like calling the PL SQL say procedure multiple times, which is, which is really nice too. Okay, so this is like the key or all came for this, I'm sure. How fast is it? How good is it? We have a little benchmark. I just create some data. So you can see it's very short data. It's just a number followed by a short string. I'm going to insert that into the table. And I'm going to compare the multiple inserts there. So I just have a loop I'm using that new await syntax, but you can obviously do this with older versions. And I just insert, I have to commit at the very end. I piggyback the commit on the very, very last one versus the single insert with execute many. And again, auto commit. So this is my results. So 
the red line at the very bottom, very, very, very close to zero, is the execute many. And that's how fast it took to insert a particular number of records. And then the blue line spiraling up, spiral's perhaps not the right word, taking off up is the really slow loop method. And it's a little easier, actually, if you have a look at the data. You know, your mileage may vary, as I say there. Every benchmark is different. Network sizes, is, uh, network performances are very different. I had a kind of local database. It was desktop sitting next to my laptop, short strings. Um, but you can see you know, how many milliseconds that was, 361 versus you know, 227, as it were. It was, uh, just again for slide purposes, it's auto committed on the very last iteration of the execute. Just by the magic of ternary operator. Anyway, so even, even for small values there, you can see number of 10 rows if you look at the data set. 10 rows, it's like 38 versus nine. You know, that's pretty significant. Your mileage may vary, as I said. And another data set, so I had a bigger data set here. So I had three kind of long strings, three 1K strings, a remote database from my home to my office. And you know, performance wasn't as good. I know our um, performance tester, stress tester, was testing something like 11 columns with 32 characters, 32,000 characters in each column. And she was only seeing a sort of two times difference between execute versus execute many, but it was you know, still two times different. So you're going to need to go back and do some testing on that. But I'm kind of happy to see this. And we, we certainly do have people in various medical industries and things like that trying to load large volumes of data. So this is pretty significant performance boost. OK. Some cases you may still need to call execute many a couple of times because there are limits on network sizes, packet sizes, database buffer sizes, and things like that. Obviously, you do the same thing that you saw me would do with the execute case. You don't commit on the first loops of, of execute many, but you would commit on the last loops. Da -da -da. And here's another pro tip. Don't use Node Oracle DB. Um, yeah, we have SQL loader, we have data pump. These things are in Instant Client 12.2, so you can download them and use them for free. Don't need to have a database footprint. Um, and they're gonna be faster for some things, particularly if you've got data already on disk than trying to load it into Node and then load it into the database. Yeah, so I recommend using the right tool for the right job. Um, PLSQL, okay, I did mention that a little earlier, but uh, you can also get outbinds from PLSQL, which is kind of cute. Don't have examples. So just kind of to wrap up, just kind of want to get you out of here so you don't have to uh, stay any later than you already are staying. Um, connection management, think back when. It's the basis for all good scalability. Make sure you don't starve yourself of threads or connections. Make sure you're closing connections when you don't no longer need them so they're available for reuse. Use the best query method. Obviously, direct fetch is going to be good for many, many situations, but use result sets or query stream if you don't know how many rows are going to come back. Make sure you're tuning whichever one you do use. And then, obviously, execute many for insert update, delete merge. Use lobs as strings, I mentioned. Um, and don't forget to con tune SQL net, because there's a lot of stuff you can do in SQL net I haven't shown you about tuning sizes and things like that. So two final slides, just uh, FYI slides. So we have this thing called office hours. It's ask me anything kind of sessions. We do have a little bit of a theme. Um, we don't have a theme set for this one yet. We just say exploring, but often we'll have a few warm up slides for people just to sort of get them in the mood to ask a few questions. And then we'll just hang around for an hour to wait for you to sort of say, hey, how do I do this? Why don't you do that? That kind of stuff. So this is a, a, another way for you to contact us. Um, it's available sort of webcast or um, audio, or you can just come and chat and things like that. So it's pretty easy to, to access. And here's my final slide. Here's some references. Um, my colleague Dan McGann is very active in this space. He's certainly our JavaScript expert in the, in the group. 
and he has a, a nice series of blog posts at the moment about using um, web services with, uh, with Node.js. Um, and I've got my contact details, his contact details. And Anthony Tuaninga down there is doing a lot of work in the, the back end in terms of coding. Uh, Node Oracle DB, you may recognize that name because he's the creator and maintainer of the Python CX Oracle database interface. He's now doing a lot of work on, on all of these interfaces for us. So I do appreciate your time. I'm here for questions. I've got business cards if you want to take, take my email details, don't have them, and, and want to send me something afterwards privately. Um, I do recommend you get involved with us because we do need to know what you prioritize. Um, it's no point complaining we don't have things if you haven't told us that you need, need things. Um, and also you do have kind of direct access through us and through development, which does make life a lot easier when you do have some kind of complex problems. Really complex problems will still go through support because they can upload trace files and all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, we do what we can, best effort. So thank you very much for coming along. I hope the conference has been good. Maybe see you next year if we're in Boston or somewhere nearby. I don't know which they tend to swap cities a little bit. But uh, I've enjoyed my time here. Boston's really been uh, nice to me. It's good to be back here. I think this is my third time here, so this is, this is nice. Thank you very much.